Okay, I'd now like to uh, move on and introduce uh, Hannes Krieg. Uh, Hannes uh, has a master's in business and economics. He works at the Department of Lifecycle Engineering at the University of Stuttgart, where he's been since 2010. Uh, he works on a number of uh, lifecycle assessments and lifecycle costing projects, uh, both nationally and internationally. And Hannes is going to give an overview of life cycle assessment in the similar ways you've just heard from, from David on life cycle costing. So, Hannes. Yes, thank you very much. So, um, I'm going to talk about life cycle assessment. So, in case uh, not everybody is familiar with the term, it's basically the environmental side of uh, the life cycle thinking, the life cycle approach. <clears throat> so, today we don't know what living will look like in the future, what construction will be like in the future. Maybe it's going to be something like this, self-sufficient cities that will generate their own energy and basically yeah, be self-sufficient. Maybe it's going to be something quite different, submerged housing, maybe because we can, maybe because the sea level rose that far, who knows. <laughs> maybe it's going to be the same as it is today. Uh, we don't really know that, but what it's going to be, it's going to depend on the resources we have available. And with the availability of resources, we're right in the middle of sustainability. Because um, actually, the, one, the stuff you can build really depends on what you have available to do so. And when you're talking about sustainability, <coughs> in the public perception, sustainability often is the environment. Let's preserve the environment. But sustainability actually is more than that. So typically, we talk about three pillars of sustainability. So, sorry, this is maybe not regional correct here, but uh, <laughs> economic sustainability, then we have uh, the environmental sustainability, and social sustainability. <coughs> Now, social sustainability covers things like um, work safety, education, equal rights, equal chances. If you want to be a bit cynic, maybe call it maintaining your workforce. Um, the environment, uh, economic sustainability, we just heard about it. You can use tools like life cycle costing to it, take into account the entire life cycle of products, um, and to see which is actually, from an economic point of view, the best thing you can do. Now, when it comes to environmental sustainability, things get a bit more complex. Um, because actually in environmental questions there's normally not just a simple yes or no answer. We cannot say product one is better than product two, scenario one is better than scenario two. I want to give you a short example on that. Biofuels are a good thing, right? I mean, they help us to cut carbon emissions. It's definitely a true statement because if you're using renewable resources to do so, you're growing those resources there's a carbon sequestration. This carbon is later on emitted during combustion, but still, if you're comparing it to fossil energy carriers, you're having a lower carbon impact. So it's a good thing everybody should only use biofuels. Not really, <laughs> because we have a problem with that. Biofuels are a bad thing. They cause eutrophication. They cause acidification. You have to grow the plants. And for this, you will need fertilizers. You will need uh, fuel to actually drive a truck around on the farm everything. You will need water uh, for the plants. You will use up space that you could use to grow food that is required to grow food, maybe. So what you have here, it's true statements, but they're both pointing in a completely different direction. So as you can see here already is that environmental questions often don't have a yes, it's better. It's mainly the most answer we can give is yes, but, or it depends. Another example, um, insulating houses. So if you're insulating your house, you reduce the heating demand, thereby you reduce the amount of energy you actually need. So you need less oil, you need less gas to actually heat your building, which reduces the environmental impact. Again, true, but you have to take into account, you have to produce the insulating materials. Many of those are based on crude oil, which means we have to mine for crude oil. Um, sometimes there's a minor oil spill, as we've seen in a couple of years. Uh, which has a negative impact on the environment. Also, we have to process and produce insulating materials. Um, all of this causes environmental impacts. So, of course, on the one hand, it helps to reduce the environmental impact. On the other hand, you cause an environmental impact by trying to reduce this environmental impact, uh, the environmental impact. So, this brings us back to the three pillars. And because we don't have such easy statements on the, well, I don't want to say it's easy statements in the other areas of sustainability, but. In, environmental, uh, in the environmental field, it's maybe a bit more complex than the other fields. That's why we're using LCA, or life cycle assessment. Um, LCA is standardized. It's defined in ISO 1440 and 1440, uh, 44 series. 
And basically it's just a compilation and evaluation of the inputs and outputs and the potential environmental impacts of a production system during its lifetime. Basically, very simple. You take a look, what is going in the system, what is going out of the system, and you see what it does to the environment. Um, this may sound like a simple basic idea, but actually it's not so simple to do. Um, so first, let me focus on why we're actually taking account of the entire life cycle here. Um, similar to what we just heard for life cycle costing, there's kind of like an invest cost and an operating cost. So in, in LCA, it's normally a production phase or material extraction, and then you have an operation phase and an end of life phase. So what you shouldn't do is only focus on one phase, because what you might do, may do is maybe optimize the operation phase, but you actually uh, increase the overall environmental impact. So you try to solve a problem, and you end up creating another problem at another point in the life cycle. Um, I want to give a very simple example on that. When you're here, take a look at this picture. It's uh, basically just uh, the primary energy demand for the life cycle of two buildings. So one is around 20 years old, so building created in the 90s, and another one is a new energy efficient building. Now if you only take a look at the construction phase, you will see that actually the building from the 90s is a better choice to have because you need less energy to construct it. It's clear because you actually need less materials, you need less insulate, uh, insulation materials. So you just have less material input correlating to less energy demand. This again correlating to a lower environmental impact. But then if you take a look on the operation phase, you'll actually see that um, with a better insulation, you can actually reduce the energy demand in the operation phase. So the overall life cycle impact is much lower compared to the current building, but you wouldn't notice if you're only taking a look at one life cycle stage. And this is why it's very important from an environmental point of view to take into account the entire life cycle of products and processes you're assessing. Now this life cycle in LCA is maybe even a bit more detailed and more specific than it is in life cycle costing. Because in LCA we actually really start from, from scratch. Uh, our life cycle starts at the raw material generation. So we have mining for resources, or we have agricultural processes, but really basically where we take raw materials from the earth, then process them to some pre-products, such as concrete, aluminum, and so on. Um, then we use those materials for the production, so we have uh, the production of a building, the construction process. Then um, we take a look at the use phase, where we have uh, heating energy, operation energy, we have maintenance processes, where we'll replace some goods, where we'll have some upgrades. And finally, the house reaches its end of life, but also the components that are being uh, exchanged. So what we have there is, um, for one hand, the recycling, so we will reuse some of the materials, or use it as input material to secondary materials. For example, a lot of plastics can be used in that way. And there's other materials which we cannot recycle, so we um, do a thermal recycling, or we put them in a landfill, just to basically get rid of them. But this is the entire life cycle we're taking into account for, uh, here for life cycle assessment. Now, what we're doing along this entire life cycle, um, you gotta bear with me through this slide because this is a bit more into detail, but it's the basic idea of life cycle thinking. So if you watch out here for three to, to five minutes, you basically know everything about life cycle assessment, hopefully. <coughs> so as I just mentioned, we have the different life cycle stages. We have the raw material extractions, production of intermediates, the production of the main products, or the construction phase in construction, uh, the operation phase, and then the end of life with recycling and disposal. So what we do for every step, for every process, for every product, for every material along this value chain, is create a so-called life cycle inventory, which is basically a long list with all the inputs for one process and all the outputs. So for example, we start with a mining process. We take a look, okay, what is actually happening in a mine? What kinds of drugs are they operating there? What is the fuel consumption? Are they using explosives for mining and so on? We take a look at all those materials that go in there, add it to the production of aluminum in this example, and we also take a look at what are the emissions created by this. What are direct process emissions? What are emissions from the upstream value chain? What are wastes? Uh, are there byproducts coming out? So we create this life cycle inventory. <coughs> this sounds not so... Uh, difficult, but actually these inventories are really long lists. So typically for a product such as um, any material, you typically have a couple of hundreds to a couple of thousand inputs and a couple of thousand outputs. Now if you have for each product and each process step, a couple
couple of thousand inputs and outputs. And you take this basically from raw material extraction to a final product. So if you say here, already concrete has 2,000 inputs and 1,000 outputs, and we're just putting, uh, assessing an entire house, we'll end up with even more outputs. So we have a list of probably 10,000 in and outputs, which is not going to help anybody. Because it's just too much information. You're completely lost in detail. And that's why we have a next step, the impact assessment. Within this step, we're grouping the environmental impacts of all the emissions of the, out the outputs and the emissions um, towards a small number of indicators. So an example for those indicators can, for example, be the resource consumption. We also have a global warming potential, which is probably currently the most we call it famous the emission of the decade, or whatever you want to call it. Um, in CO2 equivalents, we also have things like ozone depletion, uh, summer smog, acidification. So typically, we end up with around four to eight indicators which is a number that actually allows you to compare things because uh, you don't have that much information. Now, what we do is group all emissions that contribute to global warming in the global warming potential. But as, and we express it in a reference unit, which is CO2. Um, but not only CO2 is contributing to the global warming potential, so we have characterization factors, which means that we actually relate or express the, uh, other emissions in CO2 equivalents. So for example, methane, contributes to global warming and has a um, CO2 equivalent of 25, which means the emission of one kilogram of CO2 has the same impact on global warming as the emission of uh, one kilogram of methane, sorry, it's the same impact on global warming as the emission of 25 kilograms of CO2. Um, and by going through this step, we actually compile this, this huge list of outputs and emissions to a small number of indicators. This was the background of LCA. Um, now let's just take a quick look at how you actually conduct an LCA, what are the steps within an LCA. Um, so the first thing you do is actually you want to know what you actually want to do with your study because uh, on what you actually want to do, what you want to compare, this will define what you will have to look at uh, on the definition of your scope, on your system boundaries, on your reference unit, on which basis you are comparing things. So this is the first step you have to take. Then you do the inventory analysis. Um, don't worry, there's no need to compile this long list of thousands of inputs. All the time there's uh, professional software tools. Uh, for example, we're using the Gabi software, which is a, a LCA software tool that allows you to create the models within the software, but also has a background database with materials, processes, energy mixes, and so on. Um, so you can just basically create your own processes by using the upstream data from the databases. You create this inventory. And then based on this inventory, you do the impact assessment. So you take a look at your system, you aggregate it in a small number of indicators, and you, take a, you can compare on the basis of these indicators. And in parallel to all of those steps, you always have to do some interpretation because your system boundaries will have an impact on your results, uh, the scope itself, the inventory, what kind of data you're using. Is it regional data? Is it a European average? Is it trim data, British data? Um, and also the <coughs> indicators you're taking into account. Now, there's quite a lot of applications for LCA. Um, I'm only taking a quick look at some. Um, the typical or the ideal application would be to actually do it when you're developing a product or planning a product, and then you can use it to systematically improve the product already during this, its development, because it will actually allow you to see what is contributing to the environmental impacts. What are the environmental hotspots? Is there a material that is maybe responsible for 80% of all environmental impacts? Is, can I exchange this material? So you can really uh, control your design process in an early stage of your product development and systematically improve the environmental impacts. Um, of course, it allows for strategic planning because actually when you're having this list of all the materials and all the inputs and outputs, you have a lot of knowledge on actually your upstream processes. So maybe you can see, uh, am I very depending on fossil energy carriers, which may have a very high price, uh, price risk. We've seen a slide before. Uh, price is doubling in the last six, seven years. So if you actually, your entire product has maybe 80% of oil along, compiled along the, the value chain because it's used as material, but also for process energy, uh, you might be in trouble and you may want to look at alternatives. Um, and another application, of course, you can use it for marketing because if you have a tool that allows you to quantify your environmental impacts and you do a study 
maybe in 2008, and then you did another study in 2012, and you can say, we can prove that we reduced our environmental impact for this product by 20%, then uh, this is something you can really use to talk to people and to talk to stakeholders. Um, what I would like to do now, really very, very quick, is um, go through an exemplary LCA, so um, just to see what kind of results you get out of it, what are the steps to get, get to those results, and uh, have a look at the results. So as a first step, we'll actually define the goal. Let's assume here we want to just quantify the environmental impact for an office building, um, taking into account the entire life cycle. So basically the raw material extraction, the construction phase, operation, and the end of life of this building. This building um, has a 1,700 square meters net floor area, and we assume a technical lifespan of 50 years. And in terms of the environmental impacts, we want to take a look at the global warming potential, so the CO2, acidification, eutrophication, uh, ozone depletion, and summer smog. Furthermore, we want to take a look at the primary energy demand uh, required for this building. In the next step, um, I'm not going to show this, we create the inventory. So we do create an LCA model within LCA software. As I said, we use the Gavi software here. Um, and we use the background databases for the, for the environmental information with the inventory data. And based on this model, we can then do the evaluation. We can assess the impacts. So we have this classification toward, uh, in the indicators we defined. And we characterize the flows to see um, the environmental impact. And then you get a result that looks something like this. So what you can see here are two main things. You get the overall environmental impact. For example, uh, for this office building in total, we have over a 50-year lifespan, 4.7 million kilograms of CO2 emissions. Um, we have 8 tons, 8.4 tons of SO2 emissions, and so on. We can see what are the overall contributions or the overall emissions to the environment. Also, we can see which life cycle stages are relevant. So what you can see here, the operation phase actually is responsible for <coughs> 60 to 90 percent of the environmental impact of the entire building, while production makes up 10 to 20 percent of the environmental impacts, depending on the impact category. So if you want to cut the overall environmental impact of this building by 10 percent, this will show you, okay, what you got to do is take a look at the operating phase, because if you want to take out 10 percent of the overall environmental impact during the production or the construction phase, you're going to have a really hard time because in some parts you will have to cut your environmental impact by 90, 95 percent. And this is probably going to be very challenging without going into too much details. Um, you can then, of course, drill down the results further. So this is, for example, the impacts of the production phase, where you can now see uh, where are they actually coming from. Is it from the equipments installed? Is it from uh, the walls? Is it from ceilings? Is it from the foundation? Um, in the next step, you can go even further down so you can see, okay, where are the impacts from the, the walls coming from? Is it the materials? Is it processing? Um, is it transportation processes in there? So you can really drill down your results from a very high level, just take a look at the life cycle stages, so production, operation, end of life, and then go down to single materials, single energy carriers. Um, so you got a lot of information in LCA studies, actually. Um, maybe already summing up. Um, is to say that LCA is a very powerful and suitable tool that allows you to quantify the environmental impacts for various products, for processes, and um, thereby gives you a basis for systematic improvement and also for comparing product systems on a numerical basis. Um, it helps you to detect strategic risks, for example, dependency on fossil energy carriers, resource depletion. Um, it also helps you to be proactive for things like emission trading schemes or for uh, legal reg uh, registrations, uh, not registrations, legal limitations on environmental impacts. Um, it can support an organizational environmental management system like the ISO 1401. Um, the method is scientifically based, but the good news is, is it's actually applied in industry. So it's been applied heavily in automotive sector, but also in the construction sector. So. Um, I think it started in automotive uh, in the late 80s, where they were doing a lot of work, but the construction sector has been picking up quickly. There's a lot of uh, sustainability schemes, such as BREAM, LEED, in Germany we have the DGMB. Um, there's also things like EPDs, Environmental Product Declarations, which is a standard reporting template to report the environmental impacts of different products. So it's being applied in industry in all sectors. Um, 
and there's professional software systems that give you background information that allow you to manage your data, that give you all the information you need and allow you to create the models and to evaluate those. And thereby LCA can be a key element for the systematical improvement of sustainability aspects of products. And because only if you know the actual environmental impacts of products, you know where to improve, where you want to tackle a problem and where to uh, yeah, attack and improve things. So that was uh, a quite short summary on LCA. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer those now or during the coffee break. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hannes, for that very uh, clear presentation on uh, life cycle assessment. Uh, for those of you who thought that life cycle costing was a complex area, um, <laughs> life cycle assessment clearly has uh, more data and perhaps more variations that can be uh, input to it. Uh, I think the important point you made for me um, at the end is that actually with life cycle, and taking a life cycle assessment uh, is all about, um, if you like, the search for ever greater sustainability. It's uh, almost about encouraging a mindset and uh, awareness of issues as opposed to perhaps being absolutely certain that you're going into 114.7 grams of um, CO2. Good morning, Ralph Bint from a uh, well-known modular manufacturer, uh, also known as Porter Cabin. Okay, so we all think of little grey boxes. We do bigger things than that. Uh, to keep it fairly simple and, and concise, under uh, CNTC 350, there are three areas to be looked at. One is uh, cost, uh, the second area, uh, environmental, which you've covered, and then the more difficult one, which is social, which everybody keeps a very low profile on, I notice. But under the environmental part that you've looked at, uh, sorry, let, let's keep it the simple part first, the, the, the costing part. If we, you are pricing something in Europe in um, euros and we're pricing things over here in uh, sterling, there's a simple conversion ratio uh, and we can all probably cope with that. But when it comes to the environmental, we might be looking at global warming potential, CO2 equivalent or a, a eutrophication. How, how do we compare apples with bananas? It really is a bit of a joke and until there is a common ground as to how this can go forward, really we're lost. I believe. Can you comment, please? Yeah, um, it's a good point. For global warming potential, it's a bit different because, as you said, it's global. So uh, the emission of CO2 equivalents, it doesn't really matter where it occurs. Um, so it's a global problem, and the impact is global. There's a number of regional or local impacts, such, such as acidification or eutrophication. Um, what we're doing here is basically just give information on the actual impact or uh, the amount of emissions that occur from a product or process. So to the interpretation of these numbers is of course depending on the region you're in, on your, um, maybe on your organizational goals, what you want to achieve in terms of sustainability, also on the ecosystem you're in. Um, this is of course still a field that is being worked on, um, the regionalization and localization of impacts. Um, because it, it depends really in what kind of ecosystem you're operating um, and on the current status of this ecosystem, if, whether your emission will actually have a contribution to this or maybe make it worse, or maybe it's already so bad that it doesn't really matter anymore. <laughs> and, but um, for the other part, we have uh, also local data sets. So there's um, different energy mixes, there's different uh, data sets that are adapted to, to uh, specific national uh, system boundaries. A uh, question at the back, while, while um, that, that, the microphone is reaching out, I have to say that in terms of comparing um, apples and pears, it's a, um, a well-known issue with things like green and lead, uh, which are inherently exercises in comparing apples and pears, and that ultimately is driven by um, a, a working panel that's established to work out what the relative weighting should be of the different sections within the environmental assessment. So I suspect something similar uh, will, will emerge in time. Anyway, question at the back. Stephen Richardson from Reading University. I'm um, looking at embodied carbon in the retail sector. Uh, my question is, is how do we um, push this from something that is is in the realm of, of the specialist life cycle assessor down into uh, the design teams? Because ultimately, it needs to be them that are making decisions on um, 
you know, on life cycle issues. But if you know, if they're having to use enormous LCA tools like Gabby, um, it, it just seems a bit, a bit sort of um, unrealistic to expect them to do that. Uh, so, if you've got any thoughts on how to how to push it down, sort of down the chain to the designers. Um, there's actually a lot of efforts going on to create more easy to use LCA tools, for example, Selecta that we're going to talk about, um, which aim actually at not only expert LCA users, but aim at making LCA that simple and that understandable that basically designers and everybody, or almost everybody, can use it without needing uh, <coughs> much expert knowledge. So the development is really going in a way that makes LCA easier to use, um, especially in like I don't want to say simple LCAs, but uh, as long as you don't have a very specialized problem, uh, we want to empower people to actually use or create easier to use tools, and that will empower people to create their own LCA studies. Maybe there's uh, plugins for planning tools already in, in some areas, um, and other easy to use tools as select our work. We will see something on later on. Development is clearly going to easy to use LCA. Thank you. There's another question. Um, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Owen Abbey. I'm from BRE. Um, I'm just trying to contribute to your response, Hannes, to this question. Um, the, the issue about uh, comparability is pretty tricky because the standards try to tell you that you shouldn't use LCA straightforward by direct comparison unless you can compare based on the performance for example, of a, um, of a product, which is what BRE has done in the Green Guide, which I know that they're a little, it's a bit controversial for some people. But what they try to do is to say, if you do an LCA assessment for a product as used uh, with something what we call a functional unit, so we want to say in an external wall, this block compared doing this function as an external wall in one meter squared of floor area compared to a ton of steel, or compared to steel doing the same function. That way, you're not looking at one ton of, uh, of a concrete block versus one ton of steel, but you're looking at a concrete block being used to perform that function in the meter squared of external wall area compared to steel doing the same function. Uh, that's how you can use LCA essentially to compare building products. So in comparing apples with bananas, is not always the case. You have to say, you have to compare the apple and the banana doing the same thing. Um, coming down to looking at the uh, uh, how, you how you use the results or transcribe the results for common understanding. Uh, that's why the green guy tried to go through the, the own characterization, normalization, and the waiting step. Uh, I apologize if this is a bit technical. But the waiting step, if you, use a, if you do it through an expert panel, <laughs> allows you to say, for this region you're looking at, the uh, CO2 impacts are your most significant impacts, or your water, water extraction is more significant. This way you can allocate percentages, which you can then use to relate the impacts to each other. Um, I think that's about it. But if there are any more questions, I'm quite happy to talk more about them, because I work in BRE and we do the life cycle assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um,